of transformation. Yeah, right. What the heck is that all about? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I am so delighted to be here with you today. How about we take a moment and just breathe in a couple of times together? <sighs> One more time. And again. There's something magnificent about getting in unison and breathing together. And that's why singing together is so powerful for us. Um, how many of you have tried to figure out what your life purpose is? <laughs> how many already know what it is when they were born? OK, good. How about how many of you know have no idea what I'm talking about? All right. <laughs> Well, that was me. I was on that quest, the spiritual quest. What's it all about, Alfie? I had to know what my life purpose was. I was going around. I was doing all this stuff, all the spiritual questing, everything, to figure out why I was here, why, what's important, what's it all about, and who was going to tell me the answer. Like, that's, you know, there was obviously somebody who was going to tell me what to do and when to do it and how to do it. No. I kind of knew that I had to answer that my question myself. And uh, But I still wanted to figure it out, and that's why I went on my quest to become a minister. I was, that was kind of by accident, really. I joined the Center for Spiritual Living in Kelowna in 2007, and they started classes in, in September, and I started class. And it was so great. I never stopped going, and then the next thing I knew, seven years later, I was a minister. <laughs> I was like, oh, now what am I supposed to do? But Every toss just helped me deepen and understand and get this teaching and taught me how to think, not what to think, and all of that stuff. It was so powerful. And I was transforming myself and transforming my life around me as a result of it. And I was revealing uh, you know, my true nature, which is the true nature of all of us. And this is what Ernest Holmes says. When intelligence makes a demand upon itself, it answers its own demand out of its own nature and cannot help doing so. In philosophy, this idea is called emergent evolution. Emergent evolution, I like that idea. That's what was happening to me and to everybody that I know that's in this teaching. For sure, we're all on this path and we're emerging and evolving as we go. Today, I want to talk about my Shiro journey from Calgary to Kelowna. I call it the joy of transformation. Yeah, right. And the yeah, right part is because sometimes change, sometimes transformation is not comfortable. Yeah, none of us really like it. Sometimes it comes with a bit of pain, oh, or a lot of pain, losing your job, your spouse announcing they're leaving, you know, those kinds of things. You get the drift. My teacher, Dr. Ken, says the calling of spirit often feels like being pulled through cheesecloth. <laughs> you know, getting rid of the old ideas and embracing the new. And I got to tell you, this past four years has felt like that for me. First, I want to say that spiritual evolution happens sometimes quickly, much like uh, Reverend Connie's story last week where she talked about being completely healed by stage four cancer in a few short months where she had the surgery and nothing was there. They couldn't find anything. That's her miracle story. That was sometimes quickly. And sometimes it's slowly. And for me, I've had many spiritual growth spurts, <laughs> sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. However, this particular journey that I want to talk to you about was so transformative for me. I was finally able to drop the chains that had bound me to my past, my history, to my old ideas. And I've stepped into the real Leslie. And it feels really great. No longer held hostage. And now I want to share with you a couple of things that I know. Uh, that doesn't look like it. <laughs> no, that doesn't look like it. Oh, this is sensitive. No, that's not it either. Wait a minute. These are like not in order. Okay, this is it. I should number the slides too, right? 
Uh, okay, so there's a power in the universe and we can use it. We all agree with that one? Yes, okay. That everything in my life is my creation. Hmm, when I first heard that I was like, I do not like that. <laughs> what about this, this, and this? I didn't create that. And the last one that I wanted to talk about is that this is one of our spiritual principles that Dr. Ernest Holm create, uh, wrote, that heaven is within us and that we experience it to the degree that we become conscious of it. Those are big words. So as we become more conscious of heaven within ourselves, we experience it more. Uh, nope. During my studies, <laughs> I did a paper on the hero's jo journey by Joseph Campbell. He's a mythologist, and he was fantastic. He studied many, many uh, world traditions, uh, religions, and, and uh, philosophies. And his most well-known work is a book called The Hero of a Thousand Faces. And what he discovered in his research was there was this common story, this common theme of the hero's journey. And uh, so the hero's journey is the call to adventure. The hero faces challenges. They go to the abyss where death and rebirth experience transformation and return. Has anybody uh, heard of Star Wars? All right. That, it, that series of movies that was actually founded on this very hero's journey. Um, the the um, movie director was very good friends with Joseph Ch Campbell, and you can see why that was so popular. So this is kind of the stages, the call to action, adventure, in the known, then they go through the, cross the threshold into the unknown, and then they drop down into the abyss, and now the screen's gone. Let's go over on this side. <laughs> okay, good. I got an amazing team up there. And, um, and then the, an awareness, a revelation, something happens, and then um, this is, and then the return. So this is my story of this. And, so he talks, uh, so why he talks about this journey is that it's the adult returning to the unconscious. We forget that as we're growing up. And so we lost contact with that unconscious part of ourselves. And so today I'd like to share my adulting journey with you to, that I had. So imagine five years ago, Kelowna, it's 2014, things are changing in my world. A lot. I uh, I, uh, I had a job, <laughs> and uh, I was working as an accountant, and my job was changing. They didn't want me anymore, and that was kind of like, oh, I'd been there for ten years, and um, so I was like, now what am I going to do? I got to reinvent myself in Kelowna, and um, I was having a bit of uh, relationship issues. It was great in some areas. I'm not going to tell you what, but uh, the other areas. Terrible. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, at that time, weirdly, my condo that I was living in, I'd owned it for a number of years. I'd been on the rental list for four years and woo, popped up at the top of the list. And so I had 90 days to make a decision about whether I was going to rent it or not and get off the list. And I was feeling like there was something more. I'd become a minister. I'd been a minister for six months at that point. And in Kelowna, there was a lot of ministers, like 20. And there was a lot of practitioners, like 40. And uh, there was like, I just felt like it was time for me to fly the coop, leave the nest, that kind of thing. And I had this urge inside of myself. I can't really say what it was, but it was there. And I was starting to feel like there was something more for me. I wanted a bigger, bolder version of myself. Yet, I recognized my limitations, and I had a lot. I had these self-imposed limitations. I'm not good enough, I'm fear of letting go, I need somebody in my life. <laughs> so I had all this stuff going on, and I needed the external s sources to make me feel better, you know, to make me feel okay. And I had this deep-seated fear of abandonment and being left alone. Yet, inside was this crazy urge to move. I didn't understand it. It was nudging me and it was pushing me. It was pulling me through that cheesecloth. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go. So this is my call to adventure. Look where I am. I'm on the road to Calgary, Alberta, <laughs> heading east. I loaded the car with my printer 
and my office supplies, of course, and uh, gave away most of my possessions, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just heading this way. I knew that there was gonna be a lot of fun here in Calgary. Who doesn't love a stampede? Cowboys, pancakes, all that stuff, <laughs> the Bow River. So here's me, and uh, oh, me, look. <laughs> I arrived. <laughs> so, uh, it was wonderful, and hopefully this is a blank. Nope, it's not. I don't know what happened to my slide deck, but I'm working it through. Uh, so I've been here for a couple months, and then while I was in ministerial class, I decided that I, it was brought to my attention that Nanaimo was between Campbell River and Victoria. This is a geography course part of our class today. And Nanaimo would be ripe for a, a center. So I was like, road trip, so I go on my adventure to Nanaimo, and I got there, and what did I want to do when I got there? Live on a houseboat. I realized that there was actually a beautiful spiritual community there already, already being served by um, a CSL minister, who actually went on to become their full-time minister there. And, and I was gonna start something from scratch. Who was gonna be there for me? Who was gonna help me? I didn't have that guy whoever that person is, <laughs> or the, to do it. So I was like, I couldn't rely on myself. My goodness, so no, that wasn't it. And uh, I really didn't trust myself. So I was starting to cross the threshold and enter into some of the challenges on my uh, journey. So the in-between time, I was renting a basement room with a little bit of, a, two little windows in there. It was great, it was safe, secure, cheap, and uh, I was happy to be there. But I'd used to a lot more uh, than that. And uh, the other thing that was going on was, hey, no job, no prospects, no income. Uh, but remember what happened in 2015? Yeah, 100,000 Calgarians got laid off. Right, I decided to come to the city that year. <laughs> So essentially, I had no idea what I was doing in Calgary. And Nanaimo didn't seem like it was gonna work out. Ah, another call, let's go to Vancouver. I got a job opportunity for two weeks to work in a construction company. Sure, I'll go there. So jet down there and two weeks turned into three months. And uh, on December 15th, uh-oh, I got fired. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm a licensed minister. I'm a longtime accountant. I'm 57 and I got fired? Oh, man. Weirdly, that morning, though, I had done a bit of journaling and I had created a list of all the beautiful things that my ministry was going to be. It was going to be awesome, fun. There was community. We were going to have glorious connections. We were going to talk about spirit all the time and it was going to be wonderful. But look what happened. I got fired. So I'm wondering, is this for me or is it against me? I don't know. I was starting to slide downwards. This isn't something I was too proud of. Five days later, on December 20th in Vancouver, there's a knock on the door Sunday morning and it's the RCMP and they're there to inform me that my daughter is overdosed and died. My world ceased to exist. I fell headlong into that abyss of despair, depression, destitution. I returned to Calgary and I struggled really to stay alive. I didn't want to die. <laughs> I, want, I just didn't want to be alive. And I just had to make a choice every day to get up, get dressed, and feed myself. I was deeply grieving and trying to find my footing in the world. And I honestly, I don't know how I survived that for six months and a year. But interesting how it all works out because I was living with a family who had also experienced the loss of a child. And so they knew that there were no words, but that I could show up and be there any way I was, messy, crying, whatever. Whatever I was trying to do, they allowed me to be that, and I thank you for that. <laughs> I fully engaged in the Calgary Center for Spiritual Living. I 
attended classes. I started doing Sunday services regularly. I meditated. I was creating and living one day at a time. I supported myself through a little bit of accounting work for my BC clients. And um, I drained all my resources, all my savings, no problem. <laughs> I put on my happy face and I braved myself in a world without my daughter, Jessie. The following Christmas, I returned to Kelowna for a family visit and began to have a deep spiritual experience in the mountains with all the snow. I was out walking in a field and I fell down. I couldn't get back up. <laughs> I tried and I was struggling and I just couldn't get up. I was beaten down and it was in that moment when I completely surrendered. I realized that I was trying this on my own steam. I was the do it alone program. Yeah, that was me. And no matter how hard I tried, I realized I couldn't do it alone and that I had to dig deep and I had to find inside myself, find that inner light, that inner power that I had not really engaged with. And in a nanosecond, I realized and knew that there was a power in this universe and that I could use it. I could trust it, I could rely on it, and I know more deeply about this than ever before. This power was for me, not against me. I reached out my hand to my friend and she hauled me up to my feet and we trudged on. But in that moment, I had my revelation. I wasn't ever really alone, no. I was fully supported by life itself and it had been conspiring for me to find me. And as Ernest Holmes says, the only way God can evolve a spontaneous individual is to let him alone, to allow him to awaken to himself. On the road to self-discovery, he must be subject to the law of reality. And if in ignorance he violates the law, he must thereby suffer. This is not, however, because of any divine decree ordained suffering, uh -uh, but simply because it is the necessity of the case. God never intended man to suffer. Suffering may be salutary in that it leads us to a place where we learn that it is unnecessary. My adventure had shown me some things. <laughs> Nanaimo, not for me. Remember, I just didn't think I had it in me to create that space, no way. I just wasn't gonna be able to do that. And Vancouver, not for me. I was overwhelmed trying to fit myself into a situation that absolutely was not okay. It was so wrong for me on so many levels. And Kelowna, no longer for me either, not for me either. There was nothing left there. Well, Patrick was still there, but <laughs> that's more. Uh, my daughter was gone and she wasn't coming back. Opportunities to find deeper powers within ourselves come when life seems most challenging. I definitely understand that. And here's my transformation. Before returning to Calgary after Christmas, I asked my son Patrick to move to Calgary. He'd been living in the Okanagan and Summerland. And uh, we spent that evening visioning what it would be like to live in Calgary. We visioned a house, we wrote it all down. It's gonna be light and spacious, it's gonna have lots of room for us, it's gonna be in nature, there's gotta be lots of trees or something. And it's got to have a fence yard, no question, we had pats. And so that's what we wanted. And then I visioned what my accounting practice would be like. And then I began a deep meditation practice using the work and materials from Dr. Joe Dispenza. And he does a lot of scientific research on the brain and the effects of meditation on the brain and neural pathways and all epigenics and amazing stuff. And so I was digging and diving into that and sharing it with everyone here. <laughs> you should get to go through what I'm going through. <laughs> and then I met with a bunch of like-minded business professionals. I hired a business coach and I worked with a fitness trainer and got a little stronger. <laughs> 
And I knew that this was working. And I was teaching classes like The Power of Decision by Raymond Charles Barker and The Essential Ernest Holmes. So really diving into this teaching. And I knew what I wanted. I wanted to live like life like a three-year-old filled with joy. You know, they just like, hello world. And look, there's a flower and there's a dog and there's a like, food and they just love life and when they fall down they cry for a moment get up and carry on and that's what i wanted to live like that confident bold and alive <laughs> i knew i was on my right path six months later our my condo sold for a profit which was great and we found the perfect home and all we and it was exactly what we had visioned we had big trees it's spacious light filled and there was trees that sheltered birdies and squirrels and rabbits. Okay, the rabbits were on the ground, but the dog loved that. <laughs> and part of my journey has been meeting my magical kitty, Molly. And it seems like we were waiting our whole lives for each other. Uh, the moment I set up the bed in that basement, she moved on and she has not left that bed since. She literally lives on my bed. And uh, she and I have a very special relationship, and I know that she was brought to me as a spirit guide. I know that my daughter sent her to me because she wanted me to remember that there's so much good in the world. Cat purrs, warm fur, and a safe feeling. So sometimes she's a little bit shy, <laughs> but there she is. <laughs> And she just sleeps right on my pillow right here, and she's just the love of my life, and she has been there for me in the darkest of days. And so there are, you know, you're getting to feel the sense of what's happening here, right? That these things, that seemingly horrific things, and yet there's God in all of it. And uh, so one more piece of the transformation, not that piece, we'll stay with Molly. <laughs> Two years ago, my brother Julian uh, was, re you know, his cancer came back. And I couldn't even say his name without bursting into tears. I just was so distraught about this. It was like, oh my God, what's happening? Uh, I had to get some spiritual help. I knew that there was something else that needed to be freed from inside me. I contacted my mentor, Dr. Pat, and I had a session with her, and man, she was great. She listened and comforted me through my sobbing and my pain. And between the two of us, we were able to figure it out. Like Julian was my rock, my kindred spirit. He knew everything about me. And we had been really close. I don't have sisters, but I had two other brothers. And uh, I was just in competition with those two. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but what I realized was that I was holding Julian hostage to be my emotional support. And so through that session with her, I was able to free myself of that because I knew who my support really truly is. And that's God, spirit, creator, the universe. I know that that's my supply and my support. And I knew that on a, such a deep level. And so I was able to go to my brother and tell him that before he passed, that I freed him from that and that I thanked him for being that person for me my whole life. And so that was the last thing that uh, I knew uh, that I was able to say to him and to be free and to not cry now when I say his name. <laughs> I thought I would die without him, but I'm here to say I didn't. And today I, I know that I've spent over seven years in this spiritual teaching and I knew that this stuff was supposed to work and I realized and accepted that it was my turn to shine and what does Ernest Holmes says? He says, it is the practitioner's business. When he says practitioner, who is he talking about? All of us. It's the practitioner's business to uncover God in every man. God is not sick. God is not unhappy. God is not poor. God is never afraid. God is never confused. God is never out of his place. The premise upon which all mental work is based is perfect God, perfect man, perfect being. And now my return from my Shiro adventure. As I dropped into my spiritual practices, meditation, visiting spiritual mind treatments, changing my thoughts, releasing my limitations, knowing a deeper relationship with my inner guidance, playing more, 
laughing more, relaxing more, I began to experience a true awakening to my own spiritual magnificence and personal power. And that is in our center's mission statement. I embodied it and began to experience it every day. Guess what? My business grew in one year. In fact, I more than doubled my profits and or my revenues in one year. I was doing a daily prosperity treatment. It was tacked onto my vision board. My body started to transform. I got stronger and fitter. <laughs> I was doing a daily health treatment from the Power of Decision book. It was so great to read that book again. And uh, one of the lines in that treatment is, my, my health is spiritually infectious. I love that. And so I would just dig into that idea. And these are the results. And um, my grief was diminishing. As the mother of a child with addiction, who lived on the streets since the age of 15. It was so painful to check every street corner looking for her, to see her panhandling, and to have her return home for a few days only to sneak out in the middle of the night without a word. It was really a tough time in our family. For 15 years, we lived like that. But today, I know where she is. <laughs> And I know that she is free, free, free. And I am so blessed to have had her in my life for the time that I did. She was a wonderful person. I knew the truth of who she was always, 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 no matter what she looked like and no matter what she was choosing. And that's a gift of this teaching. So many people lose their children and lose that connection within their families, but this teaching teaches us that all of us are precious. Throughout my training in this philosophy, I've made great inroads to releasing limiting ideas, beliefs, and old patterns. <laughs> Thank God. This particular journey of finding the freedom from the belief that I had to constantly seek external support has been incredibly freeing. I am fully self-supporting through my own contributions. I know that God is my supply. I never worry about it anymore, not like I used to. And so, here we go. The world is perfect. It's a mess. It's always been a mess, and we're not going to change it. Our job is to straighten out our own lives. <sighs> That's so much better, isn't it? <laughs> I only have to look after me. <laughs> In summary, I committed to developing a spiritual practice that suited me and grew me. I used my imagination. I used my feelings of joy, of confidence and playfulness. I played with lots of you here, and that is an amazing way of transforming our lives. I learned new ways of being in business in life, and I welcomed the unexpected in my world. And while all I was practicing choosing this, I was choosing to be happy every day. I recognize the power of God, the good in our lives, the truth, and I completely embrace that I am 1,000% supported by spirit, God, the creator, universe, whatever you want to call it. I call it all of those things. I rely on that power every day, and that presence funds my life with abundance, with joy, love, friends, family, most of all, peace of mind. I am here to serve in joy. That is my life purpose. And I want you to know that I'm in heaven right now, today, Transformation is joy, and I'm right where I'm supposed to be. This is my miracle story. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're going to have some joyful music.